Death is a subject that many people are uncomfortable discussing, for obvious reasons. I've always been very comfortable with the subject. Having grown up in a rural area, I have seen a lot of death in my lifetime. My father was a hunter, and we raised meat rabbits and pigs for slaughter, so I spent a lot of my young childhood years helping to skin animals that were killed for our food, as well as burying many deceased pets. It was not a very animal-friendly environment to grow up in, and I think this is why I am so protective of animals now as an adult. Death has become, and in a way always has been, a major influence on my art, as well as other aspects of nature. As a child, I was almost always drawing. I drew on everything, including the walls of my bedroom. Many of my early works have been lost to time, but I still have a board that came off of my bedroom wall with some of my drawings on it. It was done when I was seven years old, just after the death of my dog Bandit. She is the subject of many of my paintings and drawings over the years, including one of my own tattoos that I designed. I would say that she was a major influence on my life, but that is the topic of another video. I was always very spiritual and intuitive as a child, and many of the images that I drew were pictures of animals who have passed on. Being intuitive, I often felt and sometimes saw their spirits around me. I carried a sketchbook everywhere that I went, and I often sketched in class when I had finished my schoolwork or doodled on paper while listening to teachers' lectures. In high school, I took art classes and had a wonderful and encouraging teacher named Roberta Fields. She encouraged the class to look outside the box and to find the real subject in a painting. She would often show us paintings and ask us to look and point out the subject. For instance, she once showed us a painting of a man sitting at a table eating. Many would assume that the subject was the man, but she asked the class to look under the table, where sat a little dog. She asked us to ponder that the subject of the painting might be the dog and not the man. I loved her way of thinking and was very sad to see her leave. She was replaced by a teacher who thought that outside-the-box thinking was a big no-no for society, and especially in her classroom. I dropped out of art class the next year, thinking that she would be teaching again. To my pleasant surprise, another teacher came to replace her, but I was unable to take his class until the following year. His name was Paul O'Toole, and he was very encouraging of my exploration into art. He introduced me to William Blake's work after seeing my pastel portraits of the taxidermy specimens in the classroom. I started out doing some pretty normal and mundane art projects, but my last teacher really let me explore whatever popped into my mind, like making my own tarot card set in class and the construction of a large lap easel that was done up to look like a giant Ouija board. It was in his classroom where I got my first real hands-on experience with taxidermy restoration. The specimens that were used for still life portraits were in pretty bad shape to say the least. I felt really bad for them being like that, especially knowing that at least one of the animals had gotten in that shape from deliberate vandalism at the hands of a previous art teacher and allowing students to rip and cut feathers off of him to use in their arts and crafts projects, much to my objection. I felt that these animals should be restored, not just out of respect for them, but to prolong their use as educational props. I sacrificed my free time to the restoration and cleaning of these animals. My teacher was very impressed with my work, and although I did not receive any grades for this project, I felt that it was one of my best artistic accomplishments of high school. I painted my first skulls in 2005 in that same art room. I brought in a mouse and a squirrel skull from home and cleaned and decorated them in class. Although my cats were expert mousers and there was no lack of materials to be found, I only decorated the two rodents. I also painted the skull of a cat that was found by my father in the woods while hunting in 1994. It is a domestic cat skull and I now assumed that it had belonged to one of my own cats, who had gone missing around that time. I repainted her skull in 2006 to a more softer style, as opposed to the very self-western native mixed with African style that I had painted her in in 2005. After high school, I focused my efforts on portrait painting and the making of Native American crafts, such as dream catchers and medicine bags. I also started making totem stones and worry dolls. I progressed into doing portraits of roadkill, feeling that it was a very sad and highly overlooked subject matter. With these paintings, I was hoping to bring awareness to the heartbreak that goes on on our highways. This was the beginning of my work with Roadkill, but it took me many more years to be able to work with Bone in the way that I am able to do now. Being such an animal lover, it was hard at the time for me to be able to cope with the sadness and negative energies that can cling to animals who have passed in such traumatic circumstances. 
In 2006, I joined a spiritual discussion group online. Through discussions with the group's founder, as well as many of the other members, I began to find myself spiritually. I began to understand better the abilities that I have had since childhood, and how to use them to help animals who have passed on to find their peace. This really helped me with developing my art, and that this was the last step in gaining the confidence needed to work with the poor creatures who had met their end on the highways or in hunters' traps. I created my own body farm in 2010 to lay roadkill animals to rest and to later harvest their bones for use in my art. When an animal is collected and laid to rest on the farm, I spend time with them. I talk to them and thank them for the use of their bodies. If the animal requests help on a spiritual level to cross over, I will assist them in finding their peace. Many of the animals I work with have died traumatic deaths and are often very confused about what has happened. Most of the spiritual work is done right on the side of the road when I collect the animal, as that is where a lot of the emotional spiritual trauma lies. Every animal that I bring home is smudged and given thanks to. If the animal is found in a state of dismemberment or severe mutilation, I will put them back together as best I can and lay them to rest with as much peace and dignity as possible. Every animal that I work with has their own story and I use my basic knowledge of forensic science, animal biology, and behavior, as well as my intuition to learn as much about a particular animal as possible before working with them. Knowing an animal's story helps me to create. I never pre-design any of my art pieces. I just sit with the bones and other materials that I plan to use and do my work completely by meditative intuition. I feel that in some way, the spirit of the animal I am working with is part author of the creation. Basically, my work with bone and taxidermy is all about embracing death and seeing the beauty that comes with it, as well as honoring the animals that I work with. In using their bones in my art, I feel that I am giving the animal a kind of immortality. Their beauty will live on indefinitely, and the last memory of that individual will not be a sad and violent one had by the person who killed them, whether by accident or intentionally but a beautiful memento of their life and a celebration of their beauty to be had by those who view and purchase my art. I hope that my art brings other people a sense of peace, comfort, and appreciation of beauty of all sides in nature, the beauty from decay. I will end this presentation with a list of artistic accomplishments over the years. In 2009, I illustrated the book Messages of the Angels by Evelyn Svendlove. In 2013, I did voice actor work for The Cleansed, I played the part of a koi dog and was able to provide a wide range of canine expressions for season two of the radio drama. There are plans to make the series into a motion comic. In 2013, the sound from one of my YouTube videos was used as part of the background for a live performance piece called The Day of the Sisob in Los Angeles by Rachel Mason. In 2013, I had an appearance on the live theater show called Welcome to Hell with Vincent Wells. For this I recorded a short video segment which was played live at the People's Improv Theater as part of their Halloween Eve special. In 2015 I had an artist spotlight interview for RealPagan.net to talk more about the spiritual side of my work. I have also done a video interview with Kinetoscope Parlor which will be aired on YouTube sometime later in 2015.